Welcome back to Civil Wars. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on why bargaining between two parties usually works. Civil war is the exception to the rule. Most states, most of the time, are at peace at home. And this lecture is going to help us explain why they're at peace most of the time and why war is a relatively rare phenomenon. This is something that I cover in depth in Chapter 2 of The Rationality of War. You can check the video description for more information on that. In any case, the basic model that we're looking at for this unit on bargaining and warfare comes from James Fearon in a 1995 article titled Rationalist Explanations for War. And the model works something like this. There are two actors, a rebel group and a government. We're going to abbreviate the rebels as R and the government as G. And these rebels and the government are negotiating and thinking about fighting over a particular set of issues or stakes. And we're going to leave that set of stakes intentionally vague. It could be tax revenue, it could be political rights, it could be autonomy. We don't really care. We want to actually leave that intentionally vague because that allows us to discuss as many issues at once as possible. We're leaving it vague for that reason. The only important thing about this good that they're negotiating over is whatever the rebels consume, the government can't. So for example, with tax revenue, the rebels, whatever value of money that they get from tax revenue that the government's going to give them, the government can't consume that amount because the rebels have it. And the same is true the other way around. Whatever amount the, the government gets, the rebels can't consume. So there's some tension there in that whatever I consume, you can't consume. Now, in this negotiation, we have two very simple choices. We can either accept that agreement or we can fight a war. Let's start off with what happens if we fight a war. Let's model this war outcome. If there's war, then the rebel group wins with probability PR, and the government wins with probability PG. So PR and PG are just some probability, some percentage of the time that the rebels or the government wins. And for simplicity, let's assume that there aren't any draws. So that means that the probability that the rebels win plus the probability that the government wins, that's PR plus PG, that equals 1. So 100% of the time, it's true that either the rebels win or the government wins. As it turns out, this is an innocuous assumption. It doesn't matter if there are draws or not. The same results will hold. It'll just be slightly more complicated to show that. So I'm not doing that here. I'm showing you the simple model. All right, so that's what happens about winning or with winning, what happens with the cost of fighting. War isn't free. War costs something to fight. You're going to lose bodies. People are going to die. It's going to be a bloody conflict. Buildings are going to be destroyed. And you're going to spend a whole bunch of money on building that military that you'd rather use on other things, like building a nicer palace for yourself or maybe even feeding your people, something nice like that. So to represent these costs, we have two different variables. We have CR to represent the rebels' costs and CG to represent the government's costs. And both of these costs are positive. Costs are palpable. So it's not free to fight a war. There's some amount of costs that we're going to subtract out of their payoffs, and that's CR and CG. These costs reflect two things. First is the obvious part, which is actually how destructive is the conflict. If the cost is really, really destructive, if a lot of people are going to die, if a lot of buildings are going to be destroyed, then CR and CG is going to be larger. If there aren't very many costs, if essentially people aren't going to be dying in large numbers and not very many buildings are going to be destroyed, then those costs are going to be smaller. The size of the costs will be smaller. The costs also are going to reflect how much we care about the issue. So if we care a lot about this particular issue, we're going to be willing to spend more on that. We're going to be willing to incur more costs in order to get what we want. So we therefore perceive each increment of costs to be not that big. We're willing to spend more on that particular conflict, so those costs are going to appear smaller. We call how much you care about an issue in political science, we call that resolve. So the more resolved you are, the more you care about an issue, the smaller your costs become. And likewise, the less resolved you are about a particular issue, the less you're willing to pay. And so the higher you perceive your costs, costs are going to be higher if you are less resolved. So that's costs. What about if you win? Well, if you win, the winner will take everything and the loser will go home with nothing. 
and the total value of the good at stake is going to be standardized to be worth one or 100%. So it doesn't matter if we're negotiating over $10 billion of tax revenue or perhaps a 100 square mile territory that a rebel group might want for itself. It doesn't matter what the nature of the good is. We standardize the value of that good worth one, being that one represents 100% of the good that we are talking about, whatever that good is. So that takes care of war. On the other hand, if there's peace, peace is simple. If we have peace, then the actors just split the good as it has been offered. So peace is very easy. If we are accepting peace, then I get some amount and you get some amount and that's it. That's the simple payoff. So now we need to decide whether we're going to go to war or we're going to stay at peace. And the way we need to do that is first by calculating our payoffs for war. So in order for the rebel group to think about whether it prefers war or peace, it needs to understand exactly what it's getting from war. So if our fights, remember that it wins with probability PR and it receives 100% of the good or worth, that's, that's the same thing as saying one, 100% is one. So with probability PR, it receives one. And then the remainder of the time, one minus PR, it receives nothing. So the second term there in that second bullet point is one minus PR times zero. And regardless of whether it wins or loses, the rebel group is going to be paying a cost to fight. So we subtract CR from its payoff. And we can simplify that. If you multiply PR times one, that's just a PR by itself. The second term disappears entirely because you're multiplying by a zero and that CR just drops down. So if I fight a war as the rebel group, I pay, or I rather I receive PR minus CR in expectation. PR again is my probability of victory and CR is my cost of fighting. So that's my payoff if I am the rebel group, if I fight. And of course, if I'm the government, it's the same thing, right? Well, the only difference here is that I've replaced all the R's with G's because it's still the case that the government's winning with probability PG and receiving one. The remainder of the time, one minus PG, it's losing and receiving nothing. And it's paying those costs of war CG if it fights. So the one just disappears. The term with the zero multiplied by something else disappears entirely and the costs drop down. So the government in expectation receives PG minus CG. Now, we have four different variables floating around in these calculations or these payoffs for war. We have a PR, a PG, a CR, and a CG. It would be actually very nice if we eliminated one of those variables. Keeping the number of variables at a minimum is always nice, and we can actually remove one of those variables. And this is going to be really useful for when we're actually working with these in greater depth in a moment. So recall that we assume that there aren't any draws in this case, so PR plus PG is equal to 1 which means we can actually remove PG from the calculation entirely by making the substitution 1 minus PR. So remember that G's war payoff was PG minus CG. In order to eliminate one variable from the entire operation that we're working with, we can use the replacement in the second bullet point, PG equal to 1 minus PR. And if you drop down to the final bullet point, you can write R's, or rather G's war payoff as 1 minus PR minus CG. So remember that 1 minus PR is whatever probability that whatever percentage of the time that the rebel group doesn't win. So in particular, it's the same probability that the government wins. So 1 minus PR is the probability that the government wins, and we're still subtracting out the costs of conflict for the government with minus CG. So that's the same thing as we wrote before. It's just a different way of writing it, but it's actually the same value as before. So this is going to be useful when we do this little tricky calculation here. Remember that we're talking about the question of whether we prefer a peaceful settlement to a war payoff. So we need to represent that peaceful settlement in some way, and the way we're going to represent it is with a value x. So x is going to be r's peaceful share of the stakes. So if I'm r and I decide on peace, then I'm going to receive some value x, all right? If I receive that value x, that's how much I receive. So when do I prefer having that x value as opposed to my war payoff value? Well, it's whenever x is at least as big as what I get from war. I'm happy with taking that peaceful offer if I'm not going to be getting any more by fighting a war. So if we look at that, I am satisfied as the rebel group if x is greater than or equal to PR minus CR. As long as I'm getting at least as much from war or from peace as I am from war, I'm happy to maintain the peace. What about the government? Well, the rebel group is getting a value X from peace, 
and the government, therefore, is going to receive the remainder. Remember, there's a total value of 1 that they're negotiating over, so the government's going to receive the remainder, which is 1 minus x. Whatever the rebel group doesn't get, the government gets. 1 is the total amount possible. X is the amount that the rebel group gets, so the government's getting 1 minus x in a peaceful deal. Now, to be satisfied as the government, you also need to have at least, from at least as much from peace as you would get from war, just like the rebel group. So remember here that the rebel, or rather the government is receiving one minus PR minus CG. So in order for the government to be satisfied, it has to be the case that one minus X is greater than or equal to one minus PR minus CG. It has to be the case that I'm getting at least as much from peace as I am from war in order to be happy. And we can simplify that inequality where you have a one on both sides, so we can subtract the one from both sides and get rid of those ones. And then if you multiply by a negative one, that gets rid of all of those negative signs that we have there. And that leaves us with x is less than or equal to PR plus CG. Remember that if you multiply by a negative one, you have to flip the inequality when you're multiplying inequalities by negative numbers. So in order for the government to be satisfied, it has to be the case that X is less than or equal to PR plus CG. Now remember, X is the amount that the rebel group gets. So what that's saying is that if the rebel group is getting too much, the government is not going to be happy and it's going to want to fight a war. And the reason that it's unhappy, the government is unhappy if the rebel group is getting a lot, is because the government's receiving the remainder. So whatever the the rebel group isn't getting is what the government's getting. So if the rebel group is getting too much, that's the same thing as saying that the government is not getting enough. So that's why the government is trying to keep that value of X or wants to keep that value of X as small as possible. All right, we have two different peace constraints. For peace to work, the two inequality, or rather, yeah, that's right, the two inequalities that we saw before have to hold. It has to be the case for R to be satisfied that X is greater than or equal to PR minus CR. And for the government to be satisfied, it must be true that X is less than or equal to PR plus CG. So for both of those inequalities to hold, it must be the case that PR minus CR is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to PR plus CG. That's the same thing as saying that X must be in between those two numbers. So if peace works, that inequality at the last bullet point must be true. We can actually work a little bit more with this. Remember that x is just some division. It's some amount between 0 and 1. That's the same thing as saying that x is some percentage of the good between 0 and 100%. Whether it's 0% or 5% or 70% or 100%, doesn't matter. It's just some amount between 0 and 1 or 0% and 100%. So if PR minus CR is less than or equal to X is less than or equal to PR plus CG, for that to even be possible, it has to be the case that PR minus CR is less than or equal to PR plus CG. The reason for that is that X has to be a value that is bigger than the thing on the left and smaller than the thing on the right. But if the value PR minus CR is bigger than the value PR plus CG, then it's impossible for X to be bigger than PR minus CR, but still somehow smaller than PR plus CG. So it has to be the case that PR minus CR is less than or equal to PR plus CG for peace to be possible. Well, let's remember two things here. First, let's remember that PR is on both sides of that inequality. PR minus CR is less than or equal to PR plus CG. So those are duplicates. We can remove them from both sides. And then we can actually move a PR or rather a CR over to the other side. And so we can reduce that inequality to the second bullet point, which is CR plus CG is greater than or equal to zero. So if CR plus CG is greater than or equal to zero, if that is true, then there exists some settlement offer X, which both R and G find satisfactory. If that inequality holds, then there is a peaceful settlement that both sides prefer to war. Well, as it turns out, CR plus CG definitely is greater than zero, and that's because CR and CG are the costs of war, and both of those costs of war are positive. So because those two things are positive, the inequality holds, which means there always exists a settlement size X, which both sides prefer to fighting a war. Let me, th let me say that again. There is always a settlement that appeases both sides. Both sides are happier with some particular value of X and taking that peacefully than fighting a war. So what that means is that negotiations can actually work because war is costly.
And while this might be a little bit difficult to mentally understand because this is a lot of algebra, we're going to, in the next lecture, see how to look at this visually. And looking at it visually will make the problem a lot clearer and help clarify exactly what's going on here and why peace is always possible. So if you're having a hard time following this algebra, it's okay. It'll get better in the next lecture when we look at this visually. Hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you next time. Take care.